Hi. I really don't know. I really don't know how to start this. I really don't. I really should have written an intro. What is wrong with me? Hold up. I don't look schnazzy enough. I need. I should look schnazzy for this. I hope that looks good because this thing is wool and I'm gonna sweat like a daggum pig wearing this. What's up? My name is the Lord Ardvart, and if you hadn't seen my t-shirt, is that in frame? I can't tell if that's in frame. It says unpaid movie critic. I like movies. I like good movies. I like bad movies. I just like movies, in general. I also like the weird and macabre, so it stands to reason that I like horror movies. And so sometimes, for Halloween, I like to sit down and watch terrible horror movies. As many of them as I can find. I started this tradition two years ago, and then it didn't become a tradition till this year. Didn't do it in 2021. Didn't do much of anything in 2021. So this year I went on my favorite free streaming service, 2 TV, and I found three schlocky, terrible, low-budget horror movies, and I'm gonna force you to watch them with me. Well, I'm not gonna watch- I'm gonna- I'm gonna- I'm gonna talk about them, though. You're gonna- you're gonna sit through that if you've not left already. If you haven't left already, then why not? This intro was unscripted, if you couldn't tell, and it's been an unmitigated disaster from start to finish, so I'm just gonna go ahead and stop the intro, and we're gonna jump straight into the movie reviews. FORWARD! Soon you'll be dead. Pushing up daisies or kept in an urn when you're dead. And your corpse will not care about all of your... First off, we have Eradication, a movie about a man who's stuck in his house all alone while the pandemic ravages the world around him, a situation with which none of us are in any way familiar. Our main character is David, who's infected with a pathogen that is causing the world to go to absolute pot. David, however, is special. I'm a vegetarian! He also happens to be the only man in the world who's immune to the nebulous plague. He's sequestered off in the mountains by a team of researchers led by his wife, Sam. Every week he takes a bag of freshly drawn blood to a dead drop, and in return they provide him with a nice house, gorgeous mountain views, plenty of food, and the knowledge that he is constantly being watched by Big Brother. Heck yeah! They also provide him with a plan to maintain both himself and the grounds in the form of a regiment for things like eating, sleeping, exercising, chopping wood, generator maintenance, etc. That is strictly maintained with a series of egg timers. The only thing they don't provide him with is entertainment and more than the most basic human contact. He has what is supposed to be a daily video call with his wife, but over time they become shorter and less reassuring and eventually just stop coming all together. So instead he picks up the phone book that he has on hand and begins working through all the numbers one by one in an attempt to find somebody to talk to on his landline. It's worth noting that that sentence means nothing to anybody born after the year 2005. Mostly his work is in vain, but one day he manages to connect to another survivor named Todd, and while their conversation is short-lived, it manages to plant the seeds of doubt in David's head that not everything is as it seems. And that really is what this movie is. A man trapped in a metaphorical box, slowly losing his mind as he realizes how little control he has over his situation. Not knowing what's true and what's a lie, and finding that every revelation leaves him with more questions than he has answers. The film does a great job right from the start of establishing a great tone of paranoia with sound bites from news reports recapping the situation and establishing that the government has installed kill drones that eradicate the infected. Military drones have been deployed across the country in accordance with the new Eradication Act. They're not letting anyone leave. If anyone leaves their home, the drones are killing them. We only have to go down the Same drones that just so happen to be sliding into David's DMs every day. David is being watched monitored, and he knows it. This makes the world David squeezed into feel really small and claustrophobic in spite of the fact that we see how big and open it is in almost every exterior shot. He has all of this space, freedom is so close, but he just can't grab it. He can't run. If he does, he'll be hunted and killed, just another biohazard on legs. And so he toes the line. Not only because they are ready, willing, and able to hunt him down if he goes rogue, but also because they're the ones who provide him with his food. A week's worth of food for every blood drop. The egg timers David has to maintain also work really well for establishing the film's atmosphere. It takes away David's agency from his own life. The people watching him tell him what he does and when. Now you eat. Now you sleep. Now you exercise. And it really is a strict policy. If a timer goes off, David stops what he's doing and attends to the timer's task. It is oppressive. This jacket's hot, I'm taking this off. <laughs> it's also worth noting that they're the closest thing this movie has to jump scares. Normally an indie movie like this would be rife with them. 
especially one on a budget as sparse as Eradication's $5,000. They're an easy way to get them to rise out of the audience, and they're cheap. But Eradication doesn't do this. It's all just atmosphere and tension. The director, Daniel Byers, has spent a goodly amount of his filmography making documentaries, and he uses that sort of directorial style a lot for this movie. It lends it sort of a voyeuristic quality. We as the audience are not watching a movie about a man in this situation, we are actually this man. And this, in my opinion, is a great way to shoot a movie like this, especially since we just went through and really are still going through the COVID-19 pandemic and associated lockdowns. And while I myself never really experienced the lockdown the same way as other people, I was working at my town's most popular grocery store, making me one of the fabled essential workers. But I imagine this film scenario will hit frighteningly close to home for some people. In fact, I think the direction might work a little too well. It went a long way towards dulling the edge of footage that would usually be tedious to watch, to the point where it actually took me out of the movie in some places. Somewhere around the 40 minute mark, David has a mental breakdown from the tedium of his life and the lack of control and whatnot. And honestly, it just didn't connect for me. Not for lack of trying on the film's part. The score and the direction were there, and the acting is really solid. Harry Aspinwall, who plays David, does a good job of showing what the character is feeling, be it unease, desperation, growing anger with his wife, or even frustration with himself. It might just be my experience with being less confined during lockdown, or maybe a script that even the director admitted was rushed, but I really didn't feel the distress the character was feeling. The plot of the film is probably the weakest link. Not that it's bad, it's just not super duper original. There are a few plot points that I genuinely really liked, especially in the last 15 minutes. But I'm not going to talk about them, because I don't want to spoil the movie. But for the most part, it wasn't anything superly original. And a few moments even stretched their own credibility a bit too far. Where the writing does succeed is in the pacing. This film has an element of mystery to it, and they pace it out legitimately well. The film gives you plenty of time to mull over what it's told you, but it never gives you so long that you get bored. Although now it seem like a good time to mention things get off to a bit of a slow start. It didn't bother me personally, but then again, I like slow movies. Heck, one of my favorite of all time is Arrival, a movie that is entirely about people trying to talk to aliens when we don't speak their language and they don't speak ours. Basically, if you don't like slow movies, maybe, maybe skip this one. A few more quick notes. In the good column, the movie score was pretty good. It did a great job of setting the tone without being the tone, which is a trap a lot of indie movies can fall into. And it had pretty good practical effects, although they were used sparingly. In the bad column, the digital effects. Like I said, the film had a $5,000 budget, and it really shows in the digital effects. They don't happen very often, but when they do, it is very obvious. And in the middle, in the neutral column, the film doesn't answer all of its own questions. It answers most of them, but there is mainly one big one that goes unanswered. I liked it like that, because to me it made it scarier, but I recognize some people might not. Also, it's worth noting in my script that that says scaries, not scarier. So yeah, that's Eradication. I'm surprised at how much I genuinely liked this one. It wasn't life-changing or anything, but it was well-made and entertaining enough. Heck, I don't even discourage you from watching it. There are worse ways you could spend an hour and a half. Speaking of... be in a slightly different place because for a second it looked like it didn't save the first section of this recording and I was not happy. Our second movie for the evening is Requiem for a Scream. Whereas Eradication was a slow burn exercise of paranoia, Requiem for a Scream is a pretty straightforward slasher. And when I say straightforward, I mean... <sighs> as far as slashers go, it is painfully generic. There's a group of unlikable meatbag characters in a remote location and a mysterious masked murderer who wants to mutilate them. You won't find much nuance to the characters or plot, but then again, that's not really what you watch a slasher for in the first place. Slashers are more about having fun watching people die in a way that won't send you to jail or therapy. But when I say that this movie is painfully generic, that doesn't necessarily mean it's awful. In fact, of the three movies I watched, this is the one I had the most fun watching. And if you're not a freak that likes movies that are slower than Insert clever analogy here. This is the one I would recommend you watch the most. Especially if you have a few friends to take the absolute piss out of it with you. Our first two meatbags... Actually, this seems like a good time to mention. I'm going to be a little bit looser with the spoilers from here on out, because the plot really doesn't matter. Our first two meatbags are the final girl, Artemis, who recently quit her... <coughs> ...career as a singer. And her best friend, Shira, who is a comic book writer that doesn't write comic books. 
Together, they're going up to Artemis' dad with self-cabin to spread the ashes of our sister, Emily. I could tell you how Emily died, but it doesn't matter. Shut up! Art's dad is also a character in the movie, kinda. The whole deal with him is that he's a major league jerkweed who forced both his daughters into a career in the music industry. I say forced, but he only really forced one of them. Emily wanted to do it and is better at it, leading her to be daddy's favorite. The favoritism has led Art's relationship with her dad to be strained, but that falls under character writing, and I have a big rant about that in a few minutes, so we're just gonna put a pin in that conversation. When Art and Shira get up to Dad's cabin, the first thing they do is have a cleaning montage, and I swear, for a second, I thought I was watching a Fulcher's commercial. The day's looking new and bright, and you're gonna start it right. The best part of waking up is Fulcher's in your car. Also, I should probably mention that when they were cleaning, they found a mysterious SD card. That's important for later, so keep it in your back pocket or under your hat, or locked in a safe. Really, anywhere where the knowledge goblins can't get to it, it'll, it'll be fine. The house clean and the coffee brewed, the movie introduces us to the rest of our meat bags and any accompanying plot devices. First up, we have pretty boy Declan, who used to date Shira and now seems to have a thing for art. Then there's Theo, a co-owner of a tech startup that makes mobile satellites. He's also both black and gay. What do you think his odds of surviving the movie are? Finally, we have Alex, who likes to party hard and has bad blood with art. And really, that is all there is to these characters. And I don't mean that that's all that's relevant, I mean that's all there is. Okay, we might get a line or two of flavor text here and there, but it really doesn't do anything to flesh these characters out. For the most part, that's the case with all the characters. Who they are doesn't really matter, only what they do. Their only purpose is to move the plot forward. They have interpersonal conflicts that open up for character development, but the character development never happens. They don't resolve their issues with one another, they don't grow as people. The conflict only serves to push the plot forward without affecting the characters in any meaningful way. Then before you know it, the conflict is the characterization. Even the failed father-daughter relationship ultimately amounts to very little. None of that's really surprising, given that it's sort of the status quo for slasher movies, but I still think it's disappointing. It's a big part of the reason why I'm not really a big fan of the slasher genre in general. Pungent moment! Was that too much? Probably. In the early 1990s, a science fiction author by the name of Dorothy Jones Haight, I don't know how you pronounce that name, coined a phrase that became known as the Eight Deadly Words. It was a phrase used to indicate an audience's reaction to a story where they, the audience, lost interest in the outcome. The phrase? I don't care what happens to these people. Any sort of emotional beat, whether it be happy, scary, sad, what have you, will be more effective if you have some sort of attachment to the characters involved. In relation to horror, if you don't care whether a character lives or dies, then it takes all of the tension out of the film and removes a goodly amount of the enjoyment you might feel. It makes your reaction from a horrific moment go from <laughs> to, oh, that's unfortunate, and call me crazy, but if I'm watching a horror movie, I want to be scared. I want to have a visceral reaction to a character death. I want to be genuinely upset when somebody dies. But if a movie doesn't develop its characters, then I won't be. That's a problem that many, or most, slashers suffer from. They rarely bother to develop characters. Whether that be because everyone knows most of these characters will die and nobody can be bothered, or just because slasher is a genre where lazy writing runs rampant. All I have to say, Requiem for a Scream is, as I said earlier, about as generic as slashers get. So whatever the underlying reason, it has poor characterization, and it leaves me less emotional when a character dies. But some of you might be thinking, wait a second, I thought you said slasher movies were more about having fun. Can you have a visceral reaction like that and still have fun? I think yes, but I've already gotten way off the rails talking about film theory, or just regular writing theory, so I'm going to conveniently rework that question to, does this movie have fun kills? And the answer to that is... Alright. They're fairly varied and the special effects work on them is fairly competent. The effects aren't going to stand up to scrutiny, mind, but I think the filmmakers knew that, so they don't linger on effect shots too long. I'm going to give them a point for it. They get the job done, and I have a very active imagination, so not focusing on an effect shot for too long lets my brain take over and fill in the gaps. And since I spent a while rambling about how bad the characters are, let me stop for a second and give the movie a bit of praise. There is one relationship that's fleshed out a fair bit. I won't tell you which one, because I can't seem to make up my mind about spoilers, 
but the way the two characters interact has some amount of history and authenticity to it. So when one of them bleeds out in the other one's arms, it does a surprisingly good job at making it feel like an actual horrific moment. Now the dialogue in that and every other scene between them is terrible, so it kind of puts a damper on it, but I'm singing the movie's praises, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put a little bit on it. And since I'm currently singing the movie's praises, it's high time I talk about the thus far unmentioned puzzle piece. Arguably the most important part of any slasher movie, and inarguably my favorite part of this one, our killer for the evening, Caleb. Yes, that is his name, Caleb. It is the only thing this movie gives him, no nickname or creepy moniker, just Caleb. But that doesn't really matter either. Just like everyone else in this movie, it doesn't matter who he is, only what he does. But since he's the killer, I'll allow. So what is Caleb up to other than trying to perfect his cosplay of the Kodama from Princess Mononoke? He's actually less scary than they are. I know that they're supposed to be the good guys, but they're freaking creepy. No, wait, hold on. Caleb might outscare them because he has superpowers. He can spontaneously create crash -ooms. I didn't alter that footage in any way. The movie is actually edited like that, and I find it hilarious because it's a one-off thing. It literally happens this one time and then never again. But seriously, Caleb has a pretty interesting shtick. He kills people, obviously, and records their screams while doing it. Then he takes those screams and remixes them into fat beats. Honestly, it's a pretty cool idea for a villain. It's one of the few things this movie does that makes it stand out from the crowd, and I personally find it kinda neat. I also really enjoyed his moment-to-moment -moment behavior. He spends most of the movie being this almost omnipresent force. He knows where everyone is and what they're doing. He knows where he needs to be and when to thwart their plans of escape. But it isn't just plot convenience, though. They actually give an explanation for how he knows. The fact that they explain it is a nice little bright spot in the script to me. Since they didn't have to. This is a two-bit slasher movie where omnipresent villains are a trope that you don't have to justify. But they did, and that explanation is actually pretty clever. Then, in the last 20 minutes of the movie, Caleb gets unmasked and he turns into this absolute chatterbox. The writing remains uninteresting, but the actor, Michael X. Summers, is clearly having a blast playing the character. I always enjoy watching actors who enjoy playing his role. He chews. They devours the scenery, and it is an absolute joy to watch. Now, finally, before I wrap up this segment, I will talk about the plot. You remember the SD card that I brought up? The one that Art and Shira found while making coffee? Well, it belongs to Caleb. It contains some of his most precious snuff recordings, and he wants it back. But to make things easier on everybody, he comes up with a plan for the meat bags to give it to him that is quick, easy, and requires no connection between the two parties. Unfortunately for him, these characters are dumb, with a capital dumb. Perhaps some of the dumbest characters I've ever seen in a movie. They have a no questions asked, everybody walks away escape route, and they spend the next 40 minutes, half the film's runtime, thinking up any excuse to just not do it. They try plan after stupid plan to get away and get help for everyone, but each and every one of those plans fails spectacularly. One of them even involves giving Caleb the SD card, following his directions to the letter. Except they don't actually give him the card. Now, I will grant you, Caleb may not look like the most trustworthy guy, and he did already kill one of them as a warning shot, which was kind of a jerk move. But I don't know, it seems to me like it would be worth a shot. He has every advantage here, and he only killed one of you. And the fact that he only kills another one when they're a hair's breadth away from calling the cops, despite all the crap they pulled in the meantime, he actually seems pretty reasonable. Oh god, am I a slasher movie meatbag? Oh yeah, and the scene where he kills the next person? They have Caleb dead to rights. He's busy disemboweling Theo. Told you his odds are bad. Not five feet directly in front of him. Art has a knife. She goes in for the kill, and Alex stops her. Are you freaking kidding me? What is wrong with you people? But now that I've dumped all over this movie, I would like to take a second to remind you that I didn't hate it. Sure, there was a lot of bad stuff. More bad than good, even. But it has a charm to it. That's the reason why people like me watch bad movies, because sometimes you find a movie that you have a lot of fun watching in spite of its flaws. Or maybe even because of them. Even when editing the clips for this review, I found this movie's freakish, quirky, downright weird charm making me grin from ear to ear. 
And if I tried to include every joke or gag I thought about over the last few weeks in regards to this movie, this video would be an hour long, it would take me two months to make, and it would make about as much sense as a David Lynch movie. But anyway, this section of the script just ticked over onto four pages, so I'm gonna wrap it up. Was this movie good? No. But I had real, genuine, bona fide fun watching it. And as far as I'm concerned, watching this movie was an hour and 20 minutes well spent. There are certainly worse things I could have watched. Speaking of... I'll see you on the dark side of the moon Our third and final movie for the evening is Short Side of the Moon, a sci-fi action horror from the good folks over at the Asylum. Now, if you're not aware of who the Asylum are, they are an indie film company that produces and distributes low-budget schlock. They're widely known for releasing cheap knockoffs of huge blockbuster titles like Transformers, Suicide Squad, various MCU movies. They've even done some for Top Gun now. Take a look at their Wikipedia page sometime. You will be shocked at how many movies they've put out. But these days, they are perhaps best known as the studio who put out the Sharknado series. Now, I've never actually seen a Sharknado movie, but I'm aware of their reputation as ridiculous movies that start off as a bunch of nonsensical gubbins and only devolve further and further into madness as the series progresses. They're insane, they're devoid of reason, and they're a total riot. They became immediate cult classics and basically the ultimate so bad it's good movies. So when I heard that the Asylum was putting out a new horror movie with the premise of sharks in a place where they ought not be, I was interested. Then I saw it was going to be set in space, and I decided then and there that I was going to be tuning into this one. Heck, this movie is what made me do this marathon. I was excited to watch this movie. You probably see where this is going. This movie sucks! It's not even so bad it's good, it's just bad. It's poorly made, it's poorly directed, the special effects are bad, the writing is pants, they hired a dead gum forest in place of actors. You can get a more dynamic performance out of late 90s Keanu Reeves. I had rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace. But that isn't what makes this movie suck. Those things are hallmarks of a so bad it's good movie. Those are what would make this movie funny if it wasn't for the fact that it commits a crime that is unforgivable. This movie is boring. To be fair, it starts off pretty well. We're introduced to a Cold War year, a Russian bioengineering lab and rocket launch platform combo pack. I guess the contractors gave him one of those bundle and save deals. In this lab, they're creating hyper-intelligent human-shark hybrids that speak Russian and are apparently very, very angry. We know they're very angry because when they escape their containment unit, they go on a murderous rampage. And it's funny! I have no complaints with this sequence. The sharks escape a high-tech holding cell using a bucket. The button to raise the alarm looks like this. One scientist's idea of causing a distraction is to fire a single flare at the sharks and then sit down for a smoke. The CGI is bad. The acting is somehow worse. This woman tries to fight off a nine-foot-tall shark man using a stiletto heel. It's really, really, really dumb, and I laughed. A lot. Unfortunately, after the shuttle launches all the sharks and one of the scientists into space, we fast forward to present day, and things go south. This is also where things get a little complicated for me, and it's hard to explain why. See, at this point we're introduced to our crew of characters, and I use that term loosely, who launch into space in a cool spaceship and then crash land on the dark side of the moon. There they meet the surviving scientist from the opening and his daughter, I'll come back to that, and together they fight sharks and try to escape the moon. And it's boring. All the usual cheesy gubbins you'd expect are still here, but they're interspersed with these dialogue scenes that bring the movie to a grinding halt. Imagine going on a roller coaster, and it's a good roller coaster full of hills and sharp curves and loop de loops, but after every one of them, they stop the ride and have somebody read a brochure about the coaster's safety features. That's what these dialogue scenes are. They interrupt your fun and vomit info at you to explain things that you don't really care about in the first place. The old cosmonaut scientist, for example. He's alive after all these years, I can accept that. The grizzled tough guy who survived an unsurvivable situation is a well-worn trope. It's a good trope. It allows the plot to move forward and teach the viewer about the world at the same time. The old survivor teaches the newcomer the ropes of their new situation. The world and plot devices are demonstrated to us, showing them organically instead of serving us an FAQ and telling us to read it all before we can continue. In the rare occasions the job is just to spout exposition, they usually give them some sort of trait to take the edge off it and make it fun. I think of Nolan from Predator 3. He spends almost all of his screen time talking, but he's insane and he's played by an 
extremely hammy Lawrence Fishburne, so he's still entertaining. <laughs> I, I told you they wouldn't see it. I told you they wouldn't. You in my house, mother This movie doesn't do any of that. It's all straight-laced, no frills, no thrills dialogue. This happens every time the movie does something fun. It's not always exposition, but there is always dialogue, and it always kills the pace. I won't go too far into detail about the dialogue. Smarter people than me have been writing essays about what makes good dialogue for as long as film has had it, so if you really care, you can look into it yourself, and I'll spare you another giant film theory rant. What I will say is that the dialogue in this movie lacks flair. There is no personality to it. Almost everyone has the same speech pattern vocabulary. It doesn't inform the characters, it exists solely to move the plot forward. It's dull. The characters are dull too. They're flat and lifeless. They have names and assigned jobs on the ship, and that's just about it. Most of them exist for one purpose. Shark bait. Shark bait! <laughs> Oh, that alarm means I can talk about something good again. And it happens to segue perfectly from the last clip. The sharks. The sharks are ridiculously silly. Look at the way they walk! I feel like I'm watching a Bee Gees video. I'm gonna cut that off so I don't get hit with a copyright strike, but trust me, I could do this all day. Really, all the animation in this movie is goofy. I don't hate the designs of the sharks either. It would be easy to make them all just the same bog-standard character model, but they don't. They have a variety of different species on display. Great whites, hammerheads, goblin sharks. They have this giant whale shark that might be my new favorite movie monster. Look at him! He's so cute! They don't all have a role to play in the plot since most of the sharks are just set dressing, but that actually gives them more points to me. They didn't have to put all this effort in, and they did, so kudos. And that, unfortunately, brings us to the only other thing I liked about this movie. The ending. Last call for spoilers, because I'm about to recap the last five minutes of this movie. Just know that there will be things I didn't talk about prior to right now. You may feel lost, and that's okay, because even if you knew the context, it wouldn't make any more sense. Sergei flies his rocket into the shark's moon colony, causing a gigantic volcanic eruption. Don't ask questions. Meanwhile, our other three survivors, including Akula... Oh shoot, I didn't talk about Akula. Uh, she's Sergei's daughter, and she's a shark. They don't explain why she looks human, but they do explain that she has gills which allow her to breathe in a vacuum. Science is dead, and the Soviets killed it. So the three survivors are fighting- Oh, and the sharks are capable of asexual reproduction. That might seem like a weird interjection, but I promise it will be relevant. The survivors are fighting the shark queen who feeds them all to her pet whale. This might seem grim, but it actually saves them because the volcanic eruption kills all the sharks, including the whale shark. But the whale shark's carcass not only protects them from the eruption, it also gets launched back to Earth by the eruption. From there, they have an inflatable life raft that Sergei gave them that is water activated, and they're just gonna wait it out until they can find help. But wait! There's more! Akula gives birth. Yep, right there in their little red life raft, Akula pops out like 20 shark human hybrid children. Akula runs off to raise them, and the movie ends with this wonderful cut. You're so fuck. Now that's all perfectly reasonable, but I do have one question. Where do the babies come from? Now you see, when two sharks love each other... No, 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 but really, I mentioned the whole asexual reproduction thing. I accept that. My problem is the matter of geometry. Where is Akula keeping these 20 or so nightmare spawn at? She's wearing spandex. We can see every curve of her. There is nowhere she could be hiding 20 shark demons. That can only mean one of two things. One, Akula is a witch. Or two, she created them out of thin air. Now, I'm not an expert in biology by any stretch of the imagination, but last I checked, asexual reproduction doesn't spontaneously produce matter. Nothing spontaneously produces matter. That's one of the fundamental laws of science. Conservation of mass. Matter can neither be created nor destroyed. What she has done violates universal law. And I kinda love it. No, really, this last five minutes, it's absolute madness. Half the time I had no idea what was going on from one moment to the next. It makes no logical sense. In fact, it is so far divorced from logic and reason that it might as well exist on a separate planet from them. And that's what I wanted from this movie. Nonsense. A great big ball of goofy, over-the-top nonsense. And to be fair, it did it to some extent, but all the nonsense is bogged down by attempts to explain it. And I don't think anybody watching this movie cares. I know I didn't. As I near the end of this review, I think that's all I can say about this movie. I don't care. There are more things I could talk about. 
I had loads of topics in my notes that I haven't touched, but I just can't bring myself to do it anymore. This movie inspired so little of an emotional reaction that I just can't muster the energy to talk about it anymore. It's boring, it undermines its own entertainment value at every turn. Even though I talked fondly about the ending, at the time I watched it, it was a slog to get through. Are there worse ways you could spend your time? Yeah, but there's also worse ways you could spend your time than driving rusty nails through your eardrums, and nobody is recommending you do that either. Seriously, don't do that. Maybe I set myself up for failure. Maybe my expectations for this movie were too high, and its inability to meet them were my own fault. Or maybe this is a movie the Asylum should have just left in its cell. I've been the Lord Aardvark. Thanks for watching. Hey there, thanks for watching this video. Making it has been a disaster at like pretty much every turn, so the fact that you stuck around to the end really means a lot to me. I'm not going to ask you to like or subscribe or anything that YouTubers usually ask you to do, but I would like to request that you comment down below with any feedback you have. Obviously, I know I need better sound. That was something, the, the, the sound quality was something that just sort of, I found out today wasn't going to work out, and I'm really bummed about it. But such is life, you know, it's, this project is already like a month behind schedule, so, you know, show must go on. Thank you again so much for watching, it means a lot, and have a good day! Oh, I, re I didn't write an intro for this, so I really hope my improv game is on point today. Also, it's echoey as all get out in this room, I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> Son of a flapjack hooker. He's sequestered off in the mountains by a team of researchers led by his wife, Sam. Gosh dang, this is fast. I'm dropping this speed on this dead gun. <sighs> Calm down, chill out. You're doing great. Especially one on a budget as sparse as Eradication's $5,000. <sighs> oh, that takes just screwed. Wait for the auto pronto to catch up. Yeah, yeah. Whereas Eradication was a slow burn exercise in paranoia, Requiem for... This is not going to work as a long-term autoprompter, I'll tell you that much. The teleprompter just turned off. Nonsense. A great big boofy gall... A, a great... That is what I wanted from this movie.